Hello, everyone. Welcome to Design Lab's webinar on data-driven UX design. And we've got our special guest for today, which is Blake Kang, who is Director of Product Design at Stitch Fix. So my name is David Sherwin. I work on the product team at Design Lab, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, though, I'm really excited to share with you some news. We have a brand new course that we're gonna be launching later this year. It's our first advanced course from Design Lab and it's on the topic of data-driven UX design. So the mission of Design Lab has always been to empower creators to do the work that they love. And this is an exciting evolution of that mission. So we hope that this new advanced course, along with the others we have planned for next year, will help you to continue to grow your skills in your design career. So why this course? Why is this the first one that we're gonna be doing? So data-driven UX design emerged as the number one skill for designers to improve in working in product teams when we reached out and talked to Design Lab alumni, which is thousands of designers that are now working in the field, as well as the hundreds of mentors that we work with in our community. This is the topic that you chose and we're really excited to bring it to you. So what we're gonna be teaching in this course is really focused on how to master using things like product data, UX analytics, and then applying that and how you think about designing, launching, iterating on digital products. You're gonna learn how to craft experiments to help you validate your design decision-making, and then prove how your work is gonna impact both product and business as a whole. And it's our belief that having this skill as part of your tool belt is gonna help you in growing as a leader within your teams. This course is gonna be a bit different from the other ones that Design Lab has done in the past. This, uh, this course is based in behind the scenes video case studies, and it's with folks that work at top companies like Stitch Fix and Asana. So what you're gonna be seeing today in us chatting with Blake is kind of a sneak peek into some of what's gonna be in one of those case studies. Uh, the course is based in activity-based learning, and it's got biweekly facilitated workshops. It is a cohort-driven format. This first course is just limited to 30 folks, so it's gonna be other peers that are working in the field as UX designers and the course is eight weeks long. It's about three to six hours of learning a week. And the cool thing is because you're here, one lucky attendee of today's webinar is going to receive a free seat in this course, which is pretty awesome. So the first cohort's gonna start on September 13th. If you want additional details, we'll post that in the chat. Okay, we're done with that. Let's go back to the beginning and let us introduce Blake. So, Blake, really happy to have you here, which is super awesome. Just to kick things off, let's get to know a little bit about you. Absolutely, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I would just have to start by saying I would have been very lucky if I had this course back in the day, but you'll learn from my background um, in a little bit why I would be so excited. So I'm Blake, um, I'm currently Director of Product Design at Stitch Fix. Uh, I have 15 years experience in building digital products and leading product design teams at early stage startups and well-known brands, including Stitch Fix, Blue Bottle Coffee, LinkedIn, and Condé Nast. Uh, my passion is in the consumer product space. I've had experiences that range from UX, UI, UX research, product strategy, and creative direction. Um, I've been at Stitch Fix for just about three years. Uh, I've had multiple roles from being individual contributor to a manager. Um, and I currently lead a product design team for one of the five company pillars called Personalized Shop. And I manage a team including product designers, UX researchers, and copywriters. So let's talk a little bit about your journey to UX design. And it's like, so you just talked about your path to sort of where you are today, but like, how did you even get started in UX? That is really interesting because I think every product designer, UX designer has a different journey. Um, I have a pretty unconventional one. I was formally trained in graphic design and print design, and I'm a self-taught product designer. I learn through countless UX books, online courses, and from industry experts. I transitioned from print to UX uh, in the early 2000s, designing travel booking engines for a digital agency back when consumers started to shift away from calling travel agencies to go into book online on uh, Expedia and those types of websites. And I just fell in love with building digital products and didn't turn back. Cool, so, so what was the path from there to getting to Stitch Fix? 
So before I joined Citrix, I read a lot about designing with data. Um, I think back in that time, there wasn't that many books. Um, however, I never had a chance to put it into practice. Stitchfix, um, I'll give you a one-line explanation right now, is Stitchfix is a personalized styling business that uses both technology and humans to help people find the apparel that they love. So our company's DNA was building products based on large-scale user data, and data scientists were often building products that later turned into consumer-facing products with the help of product managers and designers. And I found that to be a really great opportunity for me to put what I learned about designing with data actually into practice. Cool. So what do you enjoy most about doing product design? I would say the part about my job I love the most is building innovative products in collaboration with cross-functional partners and really making a business impact, coaching team members, seeing them succeed in their careers and finding their own passion. Cool. And I guess like, I'd love to know, like, what are sort of those like, fun hobbies or things that you do outside of work? So a fun fact about me is that I actually took a short detour from product design to go to culinary school and cook professionally for a couple of years. I came back to product design, just missing it way too much. Um, so like a little fun fact also about cooking is that if you love Top Chef, my most prized selfie is a picture with me and Tom Colicchio when I was in culinary school. And so cooking is really my way of relaxing after a long day or just connecting with my friends and family. Very cool. And of course, I have to ask this question. Uh, what percentage of your wardrobe is now from Stitch Fix? Oh, great question. So I would say this one is. So one really fun thing about Stitch Fix is uh, we often have things that we call sample sales. And so these are just, we have samples and um, the company gets to buy different samples uh, that we have. And then we also, of course, get fixes. So I would say at this point, since I've been here for about three years, I would say 90% of my wardrobe is all from Stitch Fix. Um, and then we'll, you'll hear more about why it's so convenient, why people will purchase from it, but it's something where I've also developed my style. I really enjoy fashion, but I really like to try different things. Um, so I would say like the majority of my wardrobe is now Stitch Fix. <laughs> All right, very good to know. So for folks that have just joined, the way we're gonna go through the webinar is um, Blake is gonna share with us what he's been working on with his team. And it's kind of a, a little peek as well into the case study we've got in our new data-driven UX course. We're gonna have then an open q and I've got a couple of questions. Uh, you should add some questions into the questions pane here in Livestorm. Uh, you can upvote the ones that you'd like us to ask and we'll do our best to try to ask as many of them as we can at the end of the time that we have. So I'm gonna hand this over more so to Blake to drive and we're gonna dig into what he's working on. He's gonna tell us a bit more about his world at Stitch Fix, how product design works, and getting into the process he went through to develop a whole new business area for Stitch Fix. Excellent. I think we have a Stitch Fix logo, if everyone can see that. Um, I know we only have a short amount of time together today, but I could pretty much talk your ear off about what we're doing at Stitch Fix. So this will be pretty high level. We'll try to get into some of the details, but I think the questions will really help um, us see where everyone wants to dig in a little bit more. All right, um, I'll start with, uh, at a high level, what Stitch Fix's mission is all about. Um, our mission is to help people find the, the clothes that they love by combining technology and data with this personal touch of Season South experts. So in just over 10 years, Stitch Fix has grown to be an approximately $5 billion company that has reinvented this $334 billion fashion and apparel industry. We've scaled by having personal styling platform that delivers this curated and personalized apparel for women, men's and kids um, in the US and UK. And so our secret sauce that we like to call uh, about Citrix's success is that it has been unique blend of art and science. Um, our technology enables our st stylists to send a fine-tuned set of clothing um, to our clients and most recently allowed us to expand into a personalized shop where each client can actually shop curated um, based on what we know about them. And what I think is really cool about Citrix is that we not only give clients an effortless way to shop from us in a multiple ways, but also we continue to build confidence in their style. And that's fundamentally what we're also trying to do. And then when we look at the overall company, how 
do things get done? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Stitch Fix product design team and the product team itself and how we work. Um, product design team has steadily grown in the last three years. There's just about 30 team members in total. Our team includes product design, UX research, and UX copywriting. The company has five pillars where you can see, I'm not gonna dig into everything about them, but you can kind of see that there's five pillars that everyone at the company is working on and everyone is working within a specific pillar so that we're making sure that the whole company is working towards the same goals. So we have an embedded team structure and what that means is everyone in each discipline is embedded in a pod working on one of the five company pillars. So each pod generally includes a product manager, product designer, a small team of engineers and data scientists. And then they work with many cross-functional partners to operationalize the entire product itself. We are a highly collaborative and communicative team. And what that means is sharing designs in our own critiques within our discipline, um, and then reviewing work with your small groups of, with cross-functional partners, with stakeholders, with senior leadership. UX research, product management, and data science teams are just a few partners that play a critical role in helping product designers understand the problem, build best-in-class innovative products. So now that you know a bit about our team structure, I'll start with what did we focus on? How do we know these are our opportunities and dig into what we actually built? Um, so with a bit of context, we, up until 2019, our core business was limited to personal styling. So it's very much focused on capturing and using consumer data to personalize hand-picked box of clothing that we call a fix by a real life personal stylist. Many people don't even know that we have real stylists that work with us. So we can see on the right is the simple interface that allows our clients to rate their style and write a note to their stylist telling them just a little bit about what they're looking for. And then the stylist will hand pick a box of clothing based on what the algorithm recommends is the best for the client based on the data that we know about them and what they wrote in the note. So we had a huge opportunity to increase client share of wallet and expand the appeal of Stitch Fix through new service offerings outside of personal styling. So the product area that my team and uh, I focus on is building this new shape-shifting mall. Um, so there's a new way for clients to shop directly from Stitch Fix that is still personalized, but doesn't need the hand-holding or the support of a direct stylist. You can imagine probably many of you um, are really into fashion uh, and just wanna shop for themselves or people who still might need a style support. Sometimes they have use cases that they just wanna shop by themselves. So let's think about shop as this uh, space age mall that you can imagine. This mall is shape shifting based on each individual. Um, not only is the shop built specifically for you, um, everything that is in each store essentially are the right things in your size, the price in your style, and the location of each store is also constantly shifting based on what you need today, what you need tomorrow. And so they're all kind of, um, in the same location next to each other. So if you show up to the mall today and tomorrow, they all might be different and it's just for you. And then we talk about the expansion. We wanted to div diversify the ways clients actually shop with us, which will enable Stitch Fix to appeal to a totally new population and serve more intense. So what you can see is we used to have fixes and then we're gonna add in shop. And this would really allow us to expand exponentially. So we have these lofty goals. Um, how did we actually know, like what were the signals to us to actually expand? So a couple of things when you're looking at the signals to expand, this is where data-driven design comes as early as the discovery phase. As we started to think about how can we grow the business, we work closely with cross-functional teams like corporate strategy, data science, product management, CX, which is customer support, to better understand the problem we're solving, identify the user and business opportunities in order to create our hypothesis. And so what we actually did was we started with quantitative data first, since this was the first, the most notable to our strategy and product partners. So from our consumer transaction data, we really saw that clients spent more on fashion 
after they use Stitch Fix, but they're spending at other retailers. So these are missed sales for us. And then based on what we saw at scale, we dug into the why with qualitative insights. And there was a high percentage of client feedback to customer service indicating that clients had a multitude of other shopping needs that didn't necessarily need the help of a stylist. And also clients expressed that they wanted to purchase directly from Stitch Fix for very specific needs in addition to styling service. And so these are the signals that we really took and it was very much a mix of qualitative and quantitative data um, that was triangulated together to formulate what we ended up shifting. Um, the piece I like to call out through the signals you need to expand is you need just enough for you and your team and your company to feel confident because you can look all day for all the right pieces of data. You can spend a long time finding all the right data to guide you. But because this is a zero to one product, we wanted to make sure that we were getting just enough to make decisions so that we can test and iterate as quickly as possible. I'm going to fast track first to show you what we ended up launching. So Stitch Fix evolved from focus solely on styling to many more ways to engage and purchase from Stitch Fix. Up until 2019, clients could, not, uh, could only write in a text box uh, to their stylist and get a fix. And then in uh, 2019, later 2019, we launched our MLP, which is a minimum, bio, minimum level product, um, and introduced our first shop feature called Buy It Again. This allowed existing clients to just rebuy the items that they loved in other prints and other styles, which was one of the highest request CX tickets that we had. And this also helped us build the foundational elements of shop, such as the product details page and the checkout funnel. Um, this might all sound very standard to e-commerce, but because personal styling at Stitch Fix was um, completely based on clients working with stylists, we didn't have a lot of these more foundational shopping uh, components. And then in 2020, we launched a new and differentiated way um, to shop called Shop Your Looks, which is an algorithmically generated uh, outfits. These product, this first product, Complete Your Look, gave clients essentially a way for them to purchase from outfits that were based on the items that they had previously purchased from Stitch Fix. We heard a lot from clients that they wanted to make their pieces very versatile. And so we did something very different than what you see in e-commerce for Shop Your Looks, which is all manually created. We created dynamic outfits based on the items people previously purchased from Stitch Fix, and they changed all throughout the day. So this also became a bit of inspiration for people to come back, not only to just purchase, but they can inspire them on how to put together looks based on the items that they already have. And so this experience was really successful. So we ended up launching trending looks for a new client acquisition. Essentially what was different was that we used the rich data that we had about clients and trending styles and put together outfits, dynamic outfits for new clients to be able to shop since um, Complete Your Looks was only for existing clients who had purchased from us. And then in late 2020, as we learned that our brands and influencer collaborations um, were, we were expanding in that area, we actually tested with a influencer uh, called Katie Serino and did a limited time summer collection. And this test was so interesting because it allowed us to feature Katie Serino's exclusive pieces and then Stitch Fix created outfits based on her exclusive pieces. So not only did we have clients purchase from her pieces, we were also able to show how our pieces fit in with hers as well. And then earlier this year, uh, we very much leaned into this element of personalization, also on our product details page, and tested the idea of how an item can actually fit on figure by showing personalized on figure imagery of our product details page. And this was in partnership with a vendor called Zkit. And this is something that we continue to iterate on, thinking about ways where we can turn our entire shopping experience to be personalized, to build that confidence for someone to make that purchase. I'm going to go back a little bit and talk about minimum lovable product. Um, and it's different than um, 
and VP that you might have heard before. So minimum lovable product to us is very much of an initial offering that users love from the start. So this is very much thinking about representing a minimum that is required for customers to really adore your product rather than really just tolerating it or like a viable one from a product perspective. And so this we can see is our launch products took years to do. And we essentially have evolved our design process, but generally the process that we used was the idea of a hybrid double diamond model. But I'll take a step back, which is building products is not linear. So when you see these frameworks, um, you can take what works best for your team and your product and where you are in the phase of your product. Um, it needs to be just consistent team collaboration and it has to be guided by the user feedback. So at every single phase, we were incorporating user feedback, we were incorporating stakeholder feedback, team feedback. So really at a high level, we had discovery, which was very much understanding the problem, exploring divergent concepts. Then once we got into having the concepts, we tested these concepts often through storyboards. So instead of creating detailed UX or UI, we are really trying to understand the customer journey and how a customer would feel throughout this experience. Once we converged on a solution, we created what is our product vision, which helped us then create a longer term roadmap and break it down into the sequencing of how you would build the experience that really made sense to the clients. A piece I like to highlight that is generally not in the design process framework is service blueprints. So because this was a zero to one product, we really needed to understand the downstream impact of every single user or client customer facing uh, interaction. Um, an easy example is the moment someone hits checkout and they get that email in their inbox, about a thousand other things have to happen behind the scenes, which is um, in the back end, we would have to actually process that checkout. Then uh, that uh, needs to go into operations. Someone needs to fulfill it. And then you get the email and then it needs to create a order confirmation and a tracking number. So service blueprints, um, when designers work on this, it really helps facilitate a lot of discussions across different teams to really indicate what are all the other pieces that we need to build in order to support even this one customer action. Then once we get into the detailed design, we start to test it in product, really to make sure that we're able to test and iterate, and then we launch something uh, that we're really confident about. I'm gonna go into a piece that I know this is very hard to hear sometimes, which is we need to keep in mind that design is super messy. You have this process and you're really excited about this framework and you really have to find the process that just works best for you and your team and your product. In reality, this is kind of what it looks like. It's a bit of a mess, but if you have the milestones from the framework, it really allows you to be guided by something that really could keep get you from one step to the next and feel like you also have control of the whole process as you're iterating, testing, and learning. Really keep in mind that you have to be adaptable, especially for zero to one. Um, things change based on what you're learning. So something I learned uh, was that, you know, we had a very strong hypothesis at the very beginning, but as we tested and iterated, our hypothesis changed and that's okay, which means your roadmap might change, your sequencing might change. And a lot of my role as a manager is to make sure that my team understands the why behind why we're changing, the timing, and what did we learn? So it's really important for everyone to be very much sharing what is happening and what you're learning as you're going along. I'm sure there are tons of questions and learnings, but I'm going to pause there because there's so much that I just went through. Awesome, Blake. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's a, a bunch of questions that the folks that are here with us have been asking. And I was thinking, actually, we might want to start by answering some of them before we get into some of the other questions I had in relationship to what you just presented. So. Mm -hmm. I think one of the top voted questions we've seen so far is from Krista, which is what specific data analytics tools should a product designer master 
in order to be able to develop data-driven product design? So, so it's kind of a big question. We'd love your take on this. Yeah, so I will answer this in two ways, which is first talk a little bit about what is data-driven design and then the tools kind of come together. So uh, I'm sure you all learned more about this or you've read a lot about it, but data-driven design is really using design to guide your decision-making process. So the design process is often treated like an art uh, and science. The intuition oftentimes is the way to go. Unfortunately, as product designers, UX researchers, we can't read the user's minds. So our approach is very much thinking about what is the balance of what the user needs? What do we know about our business? What are people doing? And being able to, again, triangulate all of these pieces of data in order for us to make a decision. And so data, when you hear about it, they're not just numbers, they're qualitative data, which is very much referring to feelings, opinions, observations that can't be expressed in numerical values. Um, and so then you have quantitative data, which then is very much the numbers and thinking about how much, how often, this is where things like A-B testing or multivariate testing, uh, web analytics, heat maps, eye tracking, those types of things come into play. And so I would say some of the tools we use that, especially for a designer where you don't have, there's not a huge learning curve to learn the tools. One is Hotjar, which is something that is installed onto your website and you can actually even do it as uh, without having to use code. Um, and that's something that designers can also um, structure themselves, they can look every day. Um, I ask designers to work with their product managers to install it on different places they wanna track and they monitor it every single day. And every uh, every single week we review how people are reacting to our experience. So I would say Hotjar is just one that is very easy and you get um, also heat map tracking as well as funnel data. And, but it, the UI is just very simple and very user friendly that is easy for any designer to start using. Um, another one is Google Analytics. I think there are so many um, education or articles about how to use and read Google Analytics that I think it's also a good way to understand what funnel data is. And Google Analytics is quite simple in terms of seeing what the funnel data, what are people doing at each point in your experience? And it's an easy way for you to get into understanding how the, what is happening and then working with your product managers to understand the actual data itself. Um, what I would say is with using data is very hard. Um, and so there's other tools like Looker, sometimes um, more seasoned experts, even on design, have troubles using something like Looker. And Looker is very much understanding the business. So things like revenue, how many people are purchasing. Um, and so, using so many data points together as a single person is really hard. When you have questions, leverage your partners. That's even something I've done in the last three years. I've become very good friends with our finance team and strategy team because I'm not an expert in numbers. That is not my background. And so when you have these tools, most of your partners are very excited to teach you about the tools that they use on the day to day. So I imagine if you're using Figma, you are so happy to teach other people how to use Figma or your UX research tools. So really leverage your partners. But I would say those are just a few tools that my team uses on the day to day. Awesome. There's actually a follow up question that I saw that the community had asked that I mm -hmm. wanted to bring up that I think is a good follow up. Uh, how does your team share data across Stitch Fix? Like, yes. Uh, ha, 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 has there been implications in how you do this through this process? How do you navigate that? Yes. So again, like I mentioned, the design process is so messy. Um, there's often times this idea that you need a research repository and everyone, when you, we have a pretty young UX research team. And so the moment we hired a research manager, everyone was like, hey, let's get a repository going. And that's how you think you share data or you have access to data. But when you think about a repository, someone has to keep it up to date. Um, you have to essentially create a library and filtering and sorting. Um, so it's actually really hard to do something like that. So when we share data, we have a multitude of different ways. There's essentially, let's break it down in 
how frequently you need something. If it is something that is a person is just hearing a nugget of information that you think is might be relevant, we actually have what we call a client insight uh, Slack channel. And we just have researchers or designers, product managers, anyone who's learning anything could just put it into the Slack channel. We tag people that we think might uh, be interested in this nugget of information. So it feels a little bit more like a conversation. So we have a Slack channel that's kind of talking about what clients are experiencing, what they're saying, what they're saying online. So that's more of like day to day. And then we have things uh, that's data that is, let's say within our shop team, we share that within our own working team. So let's say a piece of information is about the product details page. It's very much sharing within your own team. And then we really ask designers and product managers to share that more broadly in um, all hands or in a kind of a larger setting so that other people can learn from it. And then we have a repository. And so we do have a repository that's slowly building up and we have people that are able to now search for specific uh, themes or types of things that they're looking for. So there's no one way to share it. Again, this is very much about how your team likes to communicate. Um, sometimes we have just decks where we have research insights and there's, this is also why UX researchers are really critical to the team. They can help point you to the relevant research because researchers and researchers are talking to each other about what they're learning holistically. So if having a point of contact is also really important so that you can just have discussions around potentially what they might know. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, I want to, I think there's one other question that is related to this that I think would be great to hear your perspective. So you mentioned when you showed that double diamond slash messy process that mm -hmm. there's lots of points at which you had to use data to make decisions. What is just enough data? And I actually like the person, Cindy, who asked this is like in quotes, just enough data that is significantly enough to see the need to pivot or expand on your services. Yeah, so this one is a very hotly debated topic um, at our company, I imagine at most companies. For us in that stage, when we knew what was just enough was when we felt comp the team felt confident enough to move forward. When we felt like, usually when we go into research or what we're looking for, we have a list of goals and questions we want to answer. If the team feels like we've answered these questions and then when we went back to review it with our senior stakeholders, that everyone is in alignment, that is what is enough for us. So again, you can go in circles. It's really what makes your team feel confident to make a decision. Some companies need more, um, large scale data, some teams want more kind of the whys or the qualitative data. Ours is a balance of both um, to very much make a decision. But again, this is answering the questions that people have on the team. And when you're able to do that, you are able to feel like you have just enough. Got it. There's a couple other questions that I want to get to that's around da using data and data driven UX. Uh, I think I'd love to step back and say that you, it, if I understand the process you went through, which is like you said, is a multi-year journey and you're leading this major initiative to build like essentially a business. Well, like what are some of the big learnings that you had that we can learn from in terms of going through that? Like if we're gonna lead that, what should we take into account? Absolutely. The first one I always talk about is it takes a village to operationalize what sometimes people consider as a very simple consumer facing experience. So again, it might sound like we're doing e-commerce, but some of these basics are really hard for us because that's not how we originally built something. So very much of strong trust and partnership is key. Building products is really about the camaraderie of the experience, building the product together, and that's how you'll result in successful businesses. This is not about, the first time you do something is not going to be right, which is also why it took us a while to test and iterate, but some of the friendships that I built throughout this process is some of the strong, like my best friends uh, at this point of how we went through this experience together. And then we start to learn about how you work together. What are your styles of working? And the next time you do something, you'll start to not make the same mistakes that you did before. So again, the strong trust and partnership is really key. The other thing is defining clear success metrics of products. It can evaluate the success of your UX work. So as a design team, 
and research team, you want to be very closely connected to the data in order to understand the users and business holistically. Primary metrics are the best to evaluate again. So you'll be working with your product managers or your business uh, partners on this. But when primary metrics don't give you what you need, you can always rely on your secondary metrics, or you can start to rely more on the qualitative, or you might need to lean in on some of the qualitative insights to help you un better understand what's going on. Um, we talked about tools, um, designers being very close to data and also reading the raw data and formulating their own hypothesis is really critical. Oftentimes product managers, that is their job is to look at the data. So you might get information from your product managers, which is a filtered view, right? So if you're able to look at the data yourself and formulate your hypothesis, you're able to come to the table and have a much stronger discussion than feeling like you're being kind of told a set of data to take action on. So I think this is why it's really important for designers to start to slowly learn how to use different tools, what are the tools that the company uses to also make decisions. I think the last one that I'll end on is product design is a strategic discipline. You know, we're peers to strategy, to engineering, to product that help define what the product direction is. So understanding how the business operates is really important to so that we can make the best UX recommendations. Got it. Very cool. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. Although I will, I will foreground it by saying that these questions are also answered in our course, data-driven UX design, where we go deep into some of these things. But I think it'd be great for folks to hear sort of like a high-level view of what some of those things are. So the first one, this question from Morgan: uh, Were you gathering continuous feedback through these iterations you just talked about? Or was each change the result of a dedicated study? If it was the former, how did you approach that? Yeah, I would say it is the former. Um, we were getting so many, so much feedback from 360. So we were getting feedback not only from our senior stakeholders, from the working team, from each individual study. Essentially, what we did at each phase was we had to do a bit of an empathy mapping with our teams first, which is to understand what are people's goals, what are people's motivation, and when we took that in. We could just keep track of what we needed to then follow up with people on. And then we learn from users. So again, this is where hot jar feedback, if you're looking at that every single day, that will inform how you're making decisions. We will tie that in to essentially reports that we have uh, from also specific research studies that we run. So through our project planning, we have milestones. And so every single week, um, outside of those milestones, we're reviewing work uh, with the working team. So what we define as working teams are your pods plus any cross-functional team members like marketing, um, creative, um, business strategy, those types of people, so that we can also be discussing all the different insights that we're learning and then creating action items or things we need to follow up from there. So it's a bit like a parallel track of work where there's always continual insights that's coming in. You have to find ways to bake that into your decision making through the milestones or the research studies that you're running. So it's a bit of trying to keep track of many streams of information. Um, so I would say it's not always about having like very clear studies that inform like a linear process. Got it. So just letting know folks as they're adding questions, keep voting up the ones that you want us to ask because I know we've got about 20-ish minutes. So I wanna make sure we can get to as many of these questions as possible. So another question that I think that'd be really cool to get your opinion on and it's with regard to, uh, you talked about quantitative and qualitative data. So, oh wow, people are voting on this. It's already like moving around, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, in what situations do you find quantitative data to be more useful than qualitative data and vice versa? When do you need both? An example would be great. Yes, okay. Um, Stitch Fix is we have a very large data science team. And so what you can imagine is our audience is very interested in quantitative data. So that's a lot of how we make de uh, decisions. And one of the things that we had to do at Stitch Fix is very much understand that quantitative data is very important. But when you don't know the why of what's happening, it's very hard to make a decision on what you should be doing to solve the problem itself. You can have hypothesis also just based on quantitative data. So I would say our company, 
leans on quantitative data quite a bit, but this is where product design user research and people just really being interested in what the users are saying, feeling is really important because this is also about storytelling. The numbers tell a story and then the kind of the why also adds a layer to that story, which is also why storyboarding is really important because you can tell a story through numbers and through kind of illustrations and both of those things are really important for each other. I'll give you an example, which is we were debating what to do about a shopping bag, essentially. Should we have the buy now button or add to bag? So I think it's pretty common now where you see in Amazon, you have both of those buttons. We saw a lot of people um, just use um, buy now actually, which was quite interesting. And so we started to, we start to see that number, but we didn't know why people only wanted buy now. And so what we realized was people started to use add to bag as kind of like save for later. And it was a bit of a holding place. And that actually helped us really define that we actually need a place for people to save for later, to favorite something. And so it wasn't that they didn't want to actually purchase. It was that they used the bag very specifically for a save function and then buy now when they were looking at a single product. Also because our inventory actually fluctuates quite a, quite a bit, they wanted to purchase that item before that it ran out of stock. So you can kind of see that the numbers help up, helped us realize that there was something there and this was a bit of an odd behavior, but really the why helped us define what our new hypothesis was or how we were gonna solve that problem. Got it. So I'm gonna ask a few more questions about data-driven UX, and then I think we have some more general questions from the folks that are here about career and team and culture. So thinking about like all that. So here's a question about data. Um, how do you identify which data to use when working in a small team or startup with a small pool of customers? Yes. Um... Do you mean in terms of what types of data? Actually, I'm interested in what do you mean by what types of data? I think the question here is just generally, like if you're, when we, when we hear this term starting from zero and you've got a startup, it's just like, we have this hypothesis of this cool thing mm -hmm. and we've got maybe 10 customer, five customers, 10 customers we're working with and we're trying to be like, where do we start? Like, what's the, what's the data? What, what data would you start with in that kind of situation? Yeah, so generally where we try to start is very much using our metric, like our company metrics, and then we break down the metrics. So one thing that we were using is how many people were not purchasing from their fixes. So even if we have a small subset, who, are, who were the people not using their fixes? And then we started from that data point to expand out, okay, if you're not using our fixes, would you potentially use a different service offering? Start to talk to those types of people and what those people would want to actually do. The thing that I want to know about using data and using even the qualitative data is oftentimes those are smaller sample sizes. So making big decisions with smaller sample sizes is just a bit more challenging, which just means that you have to iterate more and find the themes and you have to take multiple uh, research studies, potentially ask the same questions over and over again so that you identify themes threaded throughout kind of a longitudinal study versus just a singular study. Got it. Cool. I'm seeing if there's any other data related questions and then we're going to move on to uh, Okay, I think we covered off on most of the other data related questions. Let's talk about team and careers. So this is a question. The most the most upvoted question is from Peter. Uh, what advice would you give an aspiring UX UI designer trying to identify what industry they want to work in? Oh, okay. I so one at least for me, um, and how I like to start with like this is what my perspective is of like how I experienced it, and then how I coach designers to think about it. Building products is a bit like a roller coaster ride. You really have to be passionate about the things that you're building because you spend a lot of time thinking about it during work hours and then during off hours as well. You're always trying to think about how you're solving this product. The industry. If you're just breaking into the business, think about what industries you're really passionate about and where you also like to learn. So those are, it's just a great way to dive right in and you're going to be very interested. You're gonna find all the ways to learn about the tools, how you actually design. And if you're doing something where 
you might not be as interested, it's really hard to also motivate yourself or your team to very much be uh, tackling those problems. So think very much about what is the industry that just interests you innately. And you can also start from there and look for companies that have the mission of what you believe in or the values that you also believe in as well. Well said. So uh, Lauren has a question. Often UX and UI can get confused. I'm just gonna stop there and be like, yes, often UX and UI can get confused. And I've seen hiring managers want UX designers to also be visual graphic designers as part of the job description. I'm looking for solely a UX and UX research role. How does one avoid the pitfall of a team that wants you to be a unicorn in your role? So this is the eternal debate of what you need on your team. So. What I'll start with is as you're talking to different teams and different companies, ask about how the hiring manager is thinking about their organizational design. So I'll start with when a hiring manager is thinking about who to hire, generally they're looking across their teams, thinking about their strengths and gaps or opportunities. They're looking at their product and they're looking at the time horizon that they need to deliver. And then they identify what roles they actually need. And when you, when the hiring manager can answer that like very clearly, what would this UX designer or UX research person or UI be doing? Really dig into kind of what they are looking for very specifically. Also in job descriptions, it should be pretty clear if they're just listing off a bit of a laundry list of all the things that you should be doing, that's also very hard because that means that you're going to be spread across many different things if you're looking for something very specific. So when you're talking to hiring managers, Feel free to ask how they're thinking about structuring their teams, what they're really looking for. And you could very much be learning exactly like how much they like lean on this unicorn. But I think a lot of teams or hiring managers know that, that it is harder to find a unicorn because everyone has their strengths and things they're passionate about. And so looking for that unicorn, I think many people are starting to move away from that and be more specific around what skill sets they're really looking for that is the priority of their next hire versus everything under the sun that you could possibly be doing. Awesome. So I have a question here from Cindy. Blake, you mentioned that you've worked at many different companies. What were the pros and cons of different workplace environments that you worked in, in your opinion, what makes a good workplace culture? Yes. Um, so I actually worked at all of these companies intentionally because I wanted to learn throughout my career what works best for me. And that's generally how I coach uh, my designers when we're talking about career development. Um, my goal as a manager is to make sure I'm setting up my designers up for success outside of where we are working today. So when I look at all the different environments, there's ones that work for you and there's ones that don't work for you. It's very much a personal preference for me, how I, Kind of evaluated that was I started in a consulting agency and recognized that I wanted to go deep into an industry and a product area. So doing um, many different clients just wasn't for me. However, when I started in consulting, it was great because I was able to learn how to articulate a product and storytell to clients. I was able to learn about a lot of different industries and lean in on an area that I was very interested in. And then when I went to a startup, I wanted the role to wear many different hats. So I wanted to be a U UX, UI uh, researcher, uh, thinking about the product, thinking about the back end, all of those pieces. So when you're at a startup, you get that space and you get a really big impact if you're two or like the first two designers or something at a very small company. However, the flip side of that is you are wear wearing many hats. There's not as many people to learn from or have mentorship from. So you might have to look outwards to look for mentorship um, instead of within the company. Um, and then I was at much larger companies where the product and design team are really mature. They have very strong defined processes. They also have very clear career rubric. So that means that 
I knew exactly what I needed to work on in order to get promoted or to get to the next level. It was very clear how we built products, how we reviewed things. And so that is something I've been able to learn from. And now I'm at a place like Stitch Fix where we're kind of right in the middle. And so my role as a manager is very much defining what our process is with our VP of design and um, the VP of product, as well as thinking about what the career and the rubric will look like as we grow from a 30-person team then to a 50-person team. And so all of these things are just the differences of companies and where what you want to learn at that point in your career is also very important is how you would make a choice. Got it. I have two follow-up questions from folks that have been asking questions that I think tie into what you just talked about. So you mentioned that your kind of first UX role was working in the consulting team. So uh, what was the job title for that? And what type of portfolio did you need to prepare to get it? When I was in consulting, um, I believe it was a senior web designer. This was pre UX days. So that might not be totally, totally applicable. It was a senior UX designer. And I remember uh, all I had in my portfolio were just screenshots of like one page of design. It was like the landing page of a website. And that was it. Um, and then they asked me to do an exercise, essentially, which was if a client comes to you with this problem, how would you solve it? And they, what they really wanted to know is how did I approach a problem versus the deliverable itself? So I would say some of this might be applicable right now. I would not recommend having a portfolio of just single screenshots of the homepage, um, but that's what they had at the time. Got it. So you talked a little bit about like your current and role and like this that your team sounds like it's scaling so what does it look like to scale your design team like what's worked well for you and what hasn't thank you bianca for this question i think it's the existential question right now for a lot of the teams that we're talking with absolutely so when i think about scaling the team and doing a zero to one again i mentioned it's a bit of a roller coaster ride so everything goes very quickly and there's a lot to do but the thing I realized was I can't do everything as the manager or as an individual contributor, you can't do everything, um, even though you want the product to be the best it can be. So I focused on growing the individuals when I was thinking about growing my team because I couldn't scale myself. Very much of my role is having one-on-one -on -one career development uh, discussions monthly. It is very important that managers or individual contributors ask for this, that you are having continuous discussions this, what really helped me as a manager was knowing exactly what each designer or manager wanted in their career. And I, that person and I were very much working, putting together a clear plan that was time bound. And we, I was identifying opportunities as I was seeing the product evolve and then finding those opportunities and then shaping my team based on what people wanted. So there's of course a way I think about the organizational plan, which is always an iteration. Your organizational plan might work for one quarter. And I mean, that's not ideal that it only works for a quarter. You don't want to be reorging all the time. But as a manager, you want to just keep in mind that where you're going when you're moving quickly is that things will change. And what that means for your team is you want to make sure that you're having conversations either with your team or your manager about why is this changing and what is coming up so that it never feels like it is a surprise. So I have a lot of these conversations where I share what the organizational plan might look like and get feedback from my team as well. And they have a chance to say, oh, this looks really interesting or this I think would really well work well for our culture, how we discuss things or how it would work well for our experience. And so a lot of this is me getting feedback from my team of what might work well for our team itself and then how then we fit into the broader product design team. And so I work with the VP of product design to think about how ours would fit into the broader and how other teams can also uh, learn from our experience. My biggest learning was that there's so many best practices of team structure but you have to do your own exercise of what works best for your team. And we ended up with a bit of a embedded but flexible model because so much of our world is new, things change a lot. So if we had a very strict structure where each person was just embedded onto a team, it creates kind of a disruption if things change, people start to feel like they don't have ownership or that things are always changing. So if things are a little bit more flexible, just as your baseline, it makes it easier for people to adapt to change. 
Got it. All right, so we've got, I'm gonna ask a few more questions and then we're gonna wrap things up. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that I'm gonna try to summarize in terms of just like, have you had any like mistakes or things come up along the way where data was interpreted incorrectly and you came to the wrong conclusion? What, what did you learn? I'm gonna start with a big sigh on that one, which is yes, um, we definitely have. And what I would say is this is not a singular decision. This is a team decision of what we just misread something. Um, a lot of times when you have new businesses and existing businesses competing and you're you're not always you're not always able to cover every single piece of data that you might need to make a decision so what that i'll take a step back what i mean is when you implement tracking to understand new business and the previous business it's not very clean of how the data is being piped. And so sometimes you might have overlaps in data or you might be missing pieces of data by platform. So that's something that happened to us, which was our web team is a larger team, so they move faster and iOS team is a little bit smaller, so they move a little bit slower. So when it comes to scope of work, sometimes you're able to implement certain things that um, the one or the other platform are not able to. And so when you look at the data together, it is a very different data than if you only had web. So one time we just didn't realize that the iOS platform was not tracking the same thing that the web was. And we were so confused as to why the number was so low. So we ended up creating a solution that was thinking that the number was low. And then we realized that it was just the iOS team did not was not able to pro um, provide that same tracking. So there's one of those things where when you're doing products that is so fast and new, you want to make sure that how you're tracking the data is consistent across the board. And if you're not, that you actually note that. So when you're looking at the data, you're keeping that in mind because we've actually run into quite a bit of tricky bits with that. Got it. So um, this is gonna. This is a kind of a philosophical question, which I love. Uh, how do you measure company success apart from these analytics? How do you decide yes. the value added to customer satisfaction, for example? Yes. So the thing that we talk about, because it is, we kind of go back to our values and our mission, which is help people find what they love. So the critical piece is like what they love. So we always look at what people perceive as personalization and how they feel when they're using our experience. And so again, this is why the qualitative insights are so important and why talking to your customer support team is so important. We wanna make sure that we're upholding our values. So even when we started shop, that was our UX principle was we are upholding our company values of personalization and helping people find what they love. And so when we did research, that was actually one of the questions we always ask consistently. So we're able to measure kind of the sentiment across the board and that's how we know that we're doing doing what our company is setting out to do other than making money from selling clothes. That That's really well said. And I love how you framed it. It's just like, it always has to serve that mission and higher purpose. So that's kind of like the house in which everybody is working and trying to make an impact. So it was really cool to hear how that's played out for creating this new area. This last question is near and dear to my heart because I transitioned into UX from graphic design as well. Uh, this is from Lisa. Do you have any advice for someone with a graphic design background who wants to get into product design? Is self-taught in some courses enough? Ooh, I lean on yes. Um, I feel like there's so many resources that help. I will say I will add on to it, which is <clears throat> there are so many industry experts now that are so into helping people who are rising in this industry. It is not a, there's not one way to do it. So there's many different ways. Look for mentors <clears throat> or industry experts. Everyone who is senior at this point, I'm pretty sure is so into helping others that courses are great, there are frameworks, but how it gets applied at different companies in different situations is really what you want to learn. And I think that's why I love telling our story because how we applied something is very different than how another team would apply it. So look for mentors that then you can also ask questions of what you're learning and how you apply it. And then you can start to see what, again, works well for you. And then you want to be building your toolbox. 
Awesome, thank you so much. So uh, we're gonna be wrapping this up. Folks, everybody, if you wanna go deep into the story that Blake just shared and get into the nitty gritty of what happened in Stitch Fix to create this new business area, it's in our new course that's launching in September, Data-Driven UX Design. Blake is also a mentor on the Design Lab platform. He has a limited capacity, so apologies if he cannot mentor you in your journey through UX Academy Foundations or UX Academy. Uh, if you have any other questions or want to follow up, just let us know. We'll be posting the video from this onto YouTube if you want to get back into it or share it with folks out there in the universe. So we really appreciate you joining us and we want you to have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everyone.